Okay. Hello, my name is Kofi Wilkinson, and today I'll be talking about sorting networks. So this talk will consist of four parts. First, we have the motivation behind this talk, so that is why sorting networks and the theory behind them is worth exploring. Then we'll look at what a sorting network actually is and how it does what it does. Third, we'll look at an example method to construct an efficient sorting network. And finally, we'll look at some potential applications of sorting networks and what they're being used for today. So we'll start with the motivation. So computers sort data all the time. Uh, some algorithms require us to sort data. For example, uh, Kruskal's, Kruskal's minimum spanning tree algorithm that we actually looked at last year, and also the simple binary search. And we also sort for human readability. So for example, we might sort items by cheapest on an online store. But sorting is slow. So the asymptotic time complexity bound for sequential comparison-based sorts is O of n log n time for n input items. So this brings lots of overhead into our daily computation. So any small improvements we make to the ways we sort will have a large impact. Sorting networks provide us with ways to sort our data faster by taking advantage of instruction level parallelism. So now the question is, what is a sorting network? A definition of a sorting network that I've adapted from Wikipedia says, a sorting network is an abstract device made up of wires that carry values and comparators that will reorder those values, designed in such a way that the values that enter the network will exit it in sorted order. But what does all of this mean? So we'll start with the wires. A sorting network has n horizontal wires for the data to reside on, and the data will arrive on the left-hand side of this diagram, and it will travel along the wires towards the right. Next, the comparators. So a comparator connects two wires at a particular point in the network, as you can see in the diagram, and the comparator will swap the values on those wires so that the smaller of the two values ends up on the bottom wire and the larger ends up on the top. Another way of looking at comparators is how this diagram suggests. So if a comparator takes in two values, A and B, it will place the minimum of the two on the bottom wire and the larger on the top. So the sorting property of a sorting network is, of course, what actually makes it useful. So we say, for any input sequence S that will look like this, we always end up with an output sequence like this one that contains the same elements as our input sequence and this output is in sorted order. So if we look at an example sort, here I've got uh, the input sequence 6471 and what will happen first is the sorting network will compare one with seven and it will make a swap because we want the smaller of these two to end up on the bottom wire and the larger on the top. Next it will compare four with six we make another swap for the same reason. Now we compare four with one, we make another swap. Now six with seven, this time we don't make a swap because they're already in order. And finally, six with four, we make one last swap, and now we have a sorted output. So you might have already noticed that adjacent comparisons in the network with no wires in common can be performed in parallel. And diagrammatically, we'll draw the comparators above each other. So if you look at these two comparators here, we redraw them like so. Note, however, that we may still need to draw comparators side by side for the sake of the diagram. So these two comparators here can be performed in parallel, but if we drew them on top of each other, it wouldn't be very clear what was going on. So instead, we just draw them very closely next to each other, like so. And this parallelism is where our opportunity for speed up comes from. So now I'm going to define the depth of the wires in the network, and this is an inductive definition. So we say that an input wire starts off having depth zero, and if a comparator has two inputs of depths dx and dy, both of its outputs have a depth of the maximum of dx and dy plus one. So to look at an example, we start off with zero on all the wires. After this first set of comparators, what happens is with this one, we take the maximum of zero and zero, which is zero, and add one. So now the depths of all of the wires are one. Similarly, uh, we take the maximum of one and one, and get, to, uh, get one, and we add one to make two. And finally here, we take the maximum of two and two, which is two, we add one, we get three on these two wires. So the final depths of the wires are here. And we say that the depth of the entire network equals the maximum depth of the output wires. And this is also going to equal the total running time of our sort. So this network has a depth of three, because three is the maximum. And therefore, it will take three, uh, three time steps to execute a sort on this network. So we can use sorting networks to represent what's called data-independent or data-oblivious sorting algorithms. A data-independent sorting algorithm is one that uses a set sequence of comparisons that will never change regardless of the input data that we throw at it. As an example, we'll look at what I call naive bubble sort. So normally, if you were going to implement bubble sort, you would implement it with the optimization where as you do a pass through the array, you keep track of whether you've made any swaps or not. 
And if you haven't, by the end of your pass, you can just terminate because you know it's going to be in sorted order. I call this naive because it doesn't have this optimization. This is also a recursive implementation. So what happens is we start with our base case. If n, the number of items in the array that we're actually interested in, is less than or equal to one, we simply return. Otherwise, we do a single pass with the array. So uh, we just do a pass and we compare pairwise adjacent elements um, and we make a swap if those elements are out of order. And the last thing we do is make a recursive call with n one lower than it was. So we can turn this code here into a sorting network and it will look like this in the case of n, of n equals six. So here's our first pass. What we're doing is we're comparing uh, value zero with value one, then one with two, two with three, and so on. And the final thing we do is make a recursive call with n one lower than it was. So if we take this uh, recursive definition and unroll it, we end up with a network like this. So here's our first pass, our second pass, third, fourth, and final pass. And what we can do is we can redraw this network like so. And you can see here, now there's some clear parallelism going on in this network. And all we've done is just slide the comparators along. So this is still a valid bubble sort network. And what's happening in this diagram is we're effectively starting the k plus one pass immediately after the second step of the kth pass. So if you take a look, here's our first pass. We do step one, step two, and then as soon as we finish step two, we can start the second pass whilst the first pass is continuing. Uh, we can do this because there's not going to be any data conflicts between the passes. So when n equals six, the depth of this network uh, will be defined just like we did earlier. So we just go all the way through. Here are the final depths of the wires, so this network has depth nine. And in general, a network constructed like this will have depth two n minus three. Therefore, we can say that it takes big theta of n time steps to sort n items, which is already a big improvement from the n log n that we saw earlier. But we can still do better than this. So now I'm going to look at an example of an efficient sorting network. So in order to construct this efficient sorting network, first I'm going to prove what's known as a zero one principle. This principle says, if an n-wire sorting network correctly sorts all two to the n sequences of zeros and ones, then it will sort all input sequences correctly. For example, if we had a three-wire sorting network that could sort all eight of these input sequences here, then it can sort any input sequence. And what I mean by the set S is just any set that has a total ordering. This principle is a powerful tool for two reasons. Reason one is that it makes proving the correctness of networks that we construct much easier, which we'll actually see very shortly. And reason two is that it makes software validation of networks much faster. So if we were given a network and we had to check that it truly was a sorting network, uh, instead of this being a problem of size n factorial, it's now just a problem of size two to the n. So in order to prove this principle, we first prove this lemma, which states, if a network transforms the input sequence x0, x1, and so on, into an output sequence y0, y1, and so on, then for any monotonically increasing function f, it will transform the input sequence f of x0, f of x1, and so on, into f of y0, f of y1, and so on. So in order to prove this lemma, um, we can look at what a comparator will do when given inputs uh, a and b compared to what it does when given f of a and f of b. So we've already seen what happens when given a and b. It just takes the minimum, puts it on the bottom, and the maximum puts it on the top. And very similarly with f of a and f of b, it takes the smaller of the two, puts it on the bottom, and the larger on the, and the, larger on the top. But as f is monotonic, we can rewrite this expression here like so. And we can do the same for the min. And now, hopefully, you can sort of see what's going on. So this network will first decide which of a and b is larger. And only once it's made its decision about where the two values are going, only then does it apply f. So what we can say is if f is monotonic, then compar comparator b will make a swap if and only if comparator a makes a swap. And therefore, f of a will follow the same path through the, through the network as a would. And therefore, if the network transforms the input sequence x0, x1, and so on into this output sequence here, then it will transform f of x0, f of x1, and so on into f of y0, f of y1, and so on, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. So now we can proceed to prove the zero one principle itself, and we proceed by contradiction. So we say that we're going to assume that the network does indeed sort all binary sequences correctly, but it fails to sort an input x0, x1, and so on correctly. That is, there exists an xi as an xj in our input sequence, where xi is less than xj, but the network erroneously places xi after xj on its outputs. 
So let's define a monotonically increasing function. Here I've defined one, f of x, it takes in an x. And if this x is less than or equal to the xi that we defined up here, then it will return a zero. Otherwise, it will return a one. And this is indeed a monotonic function because, uh, sorry, a monotonically increasing function because it's just a step function and the step is at xi. So we said that the network places xi after xj and by lemma one that we just proved, we can now say that the network places f of xi after f of xj. And as f of xi equals zero, defined by this function, and f of xj equals one, the network will place a zero after a one. And this contradicts our assumption that it sorts all binary sequences correctly, because all zeros should come before all ones. And we have proved this, uh, this principle. So now I'm going to look at bitonic sequences. Uh, these will be very important in the proofs uh, that our network sorts correctly uh, very shortly, which you'll see. So first I'm going to define a bitonic sequence. A bitonic sequence is a sequence that first monotonically increases and then monotonically decreases, or one that can be circularly shifted in such a way that it then does. So if we look at some examples, here's a sequence that first monotonically increases and then decreases, so this passes. Here's a sequence that first monotonically decreases and then increases. This doesn't initially fit the criterion, but if we just right shift it three places, now it's a monotonic increase and then a decrease, so this passes. Here's one that first monotonically increases, then monotonically decreases, but then there's another increase. But if we just shift this one place to the right, now we just have one large monotonic increase and one monotonic decrease, so this also passes. And finally, this sequence here, it's quite clear that there's no way that we can circularly shift this so that we only get a single monotonic increase and then a decrease, so this is not a bitonic sequence. And the zero one principle says, in our proofs that are going to follow, we only have to worry about bitonic binary sequences. And these will be of the form, some number of zeros followed by some number of ones followed by some number of zeros, or some ones followed by some zeros followed by some ones. So here is a subnetwork called the half cleaner. And the way that we define the subnetwork is we have k, which ranges from zero to n over two minus one, inclusive. And it, this network here will compare wire k with wire k plus n over two. Uh, we're going to assume that n is even just for the sake of simplicity. So what this network essentially does is it compares a value in the bottom half of the input with a corresponding value in the top half. As this network has no comparators to overlap, it has depth one. So we can say with sufficient parallelization hardware, we can execute all of the steps uh, in this network in just one time step. So here's a lemma about our half cleaners. It says, if the input to a half cleaner is a bitonic binary sequence, then these two properties will hold. Every element in the bottom half of the output is less than or equal to all elements in the top half, and both halves of the output are themselves bitonic binary sequences. So to prove this lemma, we take a visual approach. There's going to be two input cases, which are the two forms that our bitonic binary sequence can have, and both of these input cases have four subcases. So if you look at case 1.1, uh, this is the form that our input will have, uh, and what I've done is I've drawn our input out like this. So you can see uh, here's the bottom half of the input and here's the top half. And I've now drawn the two halves next to each other like so. Because if you recall what the half cleaner does, as I said, it will compare and swap a value in the bottom half of the input with a corresponding value in the top half. So what it will do is it will compare, say, value zero here with value n over two, value one with n over two plus one, and so on. So after it makes its swaps, we go from these two halves to these two halves because the ones that were in the bottom half of the input sequence are compared with these zeros that were in the top half and they get swapped because they were out of order. So our final output looks like this. And now we need to check our lemma. So it is indeed the case that every element in the bottom half of the output is less than or equal to all elements in the top half. And it is also true that both halves of the output are themselves bitonic binary sequences. So case 1.1 passes. Uh, with case 1.2, a very similar thing is going on. So we uh, once again swap the ones in the bottom half with the zeros in the top. This time though, in this middle region, we're just comparing ones with ones, so of course nothing moves. Uh, and that, then once again, here's our output sequence. And once again, you can see that both of these properties hold. Case 1.3, once again, a very similar thing. You can see that the two properties hold again. And in case 1.4, the output's actually the same, so the property holds once more. So here's those first four subcases. And very similarly, 
with the second case, the four subcases, you can see here that all four of them have the two properties holding. So we've just proved this lemma exhaustively. And with all of this information, we can now construct what's known as the bitonic sorter. So a bitonic sorter that takes n inputs looks like this. So we first have a half cleaner, and then we have two parallel bitonic sorters, which take n over two inputs. And this will sort any bitonic binary sequence. So when n equals eight, if I unroll this recursive definition here, we get this network. And if I run an example uh, set of inputs through, hopefully you can sort of see what's going on. So it uses the divide and conquer approach. Uh, what it does is it takes the input and it splits the input into two chunks where every element that's in a chunk belongs in that chunk, but the elements within the chunks themselves are not in sorted order. So it's just repeatedly doing a divide and conquer until we end up with chunks of size one. And therefore, all of the elements must be sorted now. The depth of this network is given by this recursive formula here. We have a base case of if n equals one, then it's just zero, because that would just be one horizontal wire with no comparators. Otherwise, we have this expression. This expression comes from the fact that we first use a half cleaner of depth one, and then we do two parallel bitonic uh, sorters here of size n over two. But because these are in parallel, their depths don't add up. Um, if they were in series, then we would have a two here. But because they're in parallel, we just add a single depth term. This recursive formula expands to just log base two of n. But you might be wondering now, why is the bitonic sorter useful if it can only sort bitonic sequences? The answer to this question is on the next slide. So first, we're going to look at the problem of merging. So suppose we want to merge two sorted binary sequences. We'll call them A, which is some zeros followed by some ones, and B, which is some more zeros followed by some ones. And what we can do is if we concatenate A with the reverse of B, is we get this sequence here, which is some zeros followed by some ones, followed by some more ones, followed by some more zeros. And as you can see, this is a bitonic binary sequence. So if we wanted to merge A with B, it would suffice to pass A concatenated with the reverse of B into a bitonic sorter. But now the question is, how do we reverse B? So what we want to do is somehow reverse the order of these values up here before we pass them through the bitonic sorter. So we sort of want some sort of magical device that's going to reverse these here, and only then do we pass them into our bitonic sorter. And what we can do, instead of having this device, is we can modify our first half cleaner. Uh, so as you can see, before, we wanted to compare value A0 with B3, and we're doing that here, A0 and B3. A1 with B2, once again, we're doing that here, and so on. So what we've done is, instead of having some uh, subnetwork here, We've instead made the first half cleaner do the reversing for us. The rest of this network will be just the same as the bitonic sorter. So these will just be regular half cleaners inside. Note, however, that by using this uh, technique, we've actually reversed the top half of the output of the half cleaner. Uh, so instead of the larger of A0 and B3 ending up on this wire, it will now end up on this wire. This is not a problem, however because the reverse of a bitonic sequence is still bitonic, so we can still safely pass it into this bitonic sorter up here. And what we've just constructed is known as a merging network. So it looks like this, as we've just seen. Uh, and what it will do is it will merge two sorted binary sequences in a very similar way to the merge routine in merge sort. So it takes two sorted sequences and returns one merge sorted output sequence. And this also has a depth of just log of n, because all we've done is modify this first half cleaner here. And you can see that all of these comparisons can be done in parallel. So now that we know how to merge sorted inputs, we can borrow the concept of repeated merging from sequential merge sort to construct a network like so. So first we merge uh, sequences of length one, then sequences of length two, then four, and then we end up with a single sorted output. What we've just done is we've constructed a network that implements Batcher's bitonic merge sort named after Ken Batcher. This network will sort any binary sequence. And therefore, thanks to the zero one principle, we can say that it will sort any sequence, which is exactly what we want. The depth of this network is given by this recursive formula. It has the same base case as before. If n equals one, then it's just zero. Otherwise, we have this expression. This comes from the fact that the final thing we do is use a merger, which takes n inputs, and we know it has depth of log of n. And before that, we had to sort recursively two sequences of length n over two in parallel. And once again, because they're in parallel, we just add a single term. 
And this recursive formula expands to this expression here. So we can say that it takes big theta of log of n all squared time. And what I've done here is I've plotted uh, the sequential comparison-based time complexity bound n log n against log of n all squared that we've just uh, discovered. And you can see that it scales much, much better. So we've just looked at a method for constructing a network that implements batches by tonic merge sort. But there is other methods for, uh, for constructing sorting networks. For example, there's also batches odd even merge sort. There's the pairwise sorting network. And there's also Pratt's shell sort network. Um, and all of these three alternatives have the same depth as the one that we've just looked at. And there's also what's known as the AKS network. This actually has a depth of just log of n. However, the big theta hides an incredibly large constant. It's so large that we just can't use it in any practical application. So sorting networks do have some drawbacks. One of them is that once an n-input network is constructed, we can only use this network to sort n items. If we really wanted to sort less, we could use some padding. So we could say, let's add some arbitrarily large or small values to our inputs. And then on the output, we only select out the k items that we're interested in. But there's nothing we can do to sort more than n. Also, in order to take advantage of all of the speed up opportunities that sorting networks provide us, we would need sufficient hardware to implement the required instruction level parallelism. So for example, to do 10 parallel comparisons, we would need at least 10 cores running in parallel. Finally, uh, the comparisons that the sorting network makes are fixed in advance, so it cannot adapt to particular inputs at runtime, uh, unlike, say, the non-naive implementation of bubble sort, where if you give it an already sorted input, it can return faster than it normally would. So finally, let's look at some potential applications of sorting networks and some research that's been done on them. So one way of looking at sorting networks is sort of a set of instructions for how to use parallelism to correctly sort data in short amounts of time. And what we can do is we can implement a sorting network by using GPU cores to perform the required comparisons. One way we could do this is to use one core for each wire. And these cores will run threads, which would read memory, perform comparisons, and then write back any swaps that they make. And NVIDIA has a library called the CUDA Data Parallel Primitives Library, CUDPP. And in this library, there's a function, CUDPP merge sort, which does exactly this. So the way it works is it will divide the array into chunks. Uh, it will then use your GPU cores to execute the operations of a sorting network to sort those chunks. And finally, it will merge the sorted chunks together to give you your final sorted output. And this function aims to maximize the amount of parallelism throughout the entire sorting process uh, so you can get the fastest speed from the hardware that you're running your sort on. Sorting networks are also being used elsewhere. So here's a paper that was looking at replacing the typical insertion sort base case that standard libraries sorting routines tend to include with a set of optimal sorting networks. So on this plot, uh, there's a bunch of points. Each point represents one run of sorting 10,000 items. On the x-axis, we have the size of our base case. So at what point do we stop using quick sort uh, and instead resort to our uh, base case implementation of choice? And on the y-axis, we have the number of CPU cycles required to do the sort of 10,000 uh, 10, items. Uh, this first trend is when researchers use an optimal uh, implementation of insertion sort. And the second trend is when they use an optimal set of sorting networks as the base case. And you can see that the sorting networks outperformed insertion sort very conclusively. Here's another application. So uh, there's also been research done into using sorting networks in multi-party computation to implement an efficient but secure sorting mechanism. So here's another plot. This time on the x-axis, we have the number of items that were sorted. And on the y, we have the total time it took. Uh, so once again, there's three trends. Uh, you can see that this trend here uh, did not scale very well. This is when they used a sequential implementation of bubble sort. This middle trend here is when they used a parallelized implementation of bubble sort, much like the one we saw earlier. And finally, this is when they used batches odd even merge sort, uh, which is one of the log n all squared sorting networks. And you can see that this scaled very well. So this concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening.